Earth sports many variants of life, even if the majority of people believe it to just be plants and animals. Fungi, virus, bacteria, eukaryotic, prokaryotic, archaea, wherever you look, there are quite a few kingdoms concerning biology. What is most interesting is the animal-fungi split. It's easy to view fungi as a precursor to plant life, but actually it appeared around 9 million years later after plants, suggesting that the fungi actually split from animal life, meaning that it is closer in relation to animals as well. This split gives the fungus some interesting traits concerning animal influences to their biology. Some are really good, such as antibiotics, and some are harmful, such as black molds and their effects on the respiratory functions. That being said, there are some versions of fungal life that are even more aggressive, and the response by animal life is just as strong. The issue is, should a fungus species get a hold of a host, or at least a foothold in it, this can lead to a large swath of problems for that particular animal. This is what the universe of The Last of Us is based in. A fungal spore getting a foothold in the human population and turning them into mindless, game-ending machines. But how does this specific fungus overcome the human immune system and conquer the brain? Is there anything based in reality? And what is the lore behind it? Well, strap in, because this is almost exactly my area of expertise concerning diseases and outbreaks. So, I am super excited for this one. So with that set up, let's dive into the lore behind The Last of Us. So let's start by discussing the fungus for a moment, and believe me, it's much more interesting of a domain than you might imagine. Fungus is very opportunistic and will typically only attack creatures with weakened immune systems or if they are specifically adapted to that organism. They require cool, damp places to survive and will produce spores to spread their influence. Typically these spores induce an immune response, but there are specific types of fungal spores that overcome these defenses and what's creepier, there are specific versions that are evolved to lessen the effectiveness of the human body's resistance to it, but we will get to that momentarily. Enter the Cordyceps fungus. Now there are quite a few different versions of this specific fungus, but to keep things simple we will go by its genus name. The Cordyceps fungus is responsible for the zombie ants that have captured a lot of people's interest over the years. If you are not really familiar with what I'm talking about, essentially there is a fungus that hijacks an ant's body. A spore attaches itself to the body of the ant and begins to burrow. After making contact with the brain, it will spread throughout the body producing mycelium, however it will not render the body immobile, at least initially. The Cordyceps fungus will then alter the brain at specific points causing the ant to wander away from the colony or in some cases concerning location go back to the colony. However most will find a shady place underneath a leaf and it grabs onto that point with its mandible. This death grip is where the ant ceases to be and the fungus thrives. The shady cool area allows for an explosion of growth as the fungus then begins to release spores to infect other ants. This infection can devastate a colony leading to the extinction of that specific line. This is exactly what happened concerning the Cordyceps fungus in The Last of Us. Most zombie based games are like a mystery virus or some sort of crazy parasite or a bacteria that infects the living and causes them to turn for unknown reasons. However, this fungus is something rooted in reality. It preys on animals or specifically in this case concerning the game, humans, making them change into mindless husks seeking to spread the spores wherever. However, I would say what is most interesting about all this is usually Cordyceps only affects insects. And insects, as we all know, were one of the first animals to come into being and dominated the planet a long time ago. They are also experts in adapting to different environments and reproduce on massive scales. It seems that the fungus chose a specific set of animals for this reason. But what is fairly disturbing, humans are not that far away from insects in terms of what we do. We are one of the most successful creatures on this planet. We have spread to all pieces of the world, reproduce in high numbers, we number in the billions. So where insects used to be favorable, now mammals are due to our abundance. Again, this is the last of us. The fungus made the jump to humans from insects even though insects are quite successful. The biggest issue though concerning the insects is they have limited range concerning species location. While bugs can exist pretty much everywhere, this same species does not exist everywhere. But humans are the same species and we pretty much exist everywhere. But let's stop for a second before getting all doom and gloom. Let's ask ourselves, why hasn't the fungus done this already if humans are so successful? Well, you have a tactical thermonuclear arsenal at your disposal known as your immune system. The fact is your immune system can kill you if it is triggered in the wrong way. So incoming hostiles are something that it deals with on a daily basis. So just so you know, right now, you sitting there, you are currently breathing in spores right now. Whether you are inside or outside, it doesn't matter. And every one of those spores looks at your lung as a great place for propagation. The fact is we are attacked on a daily basis by thousands of threats because the air we breathe, however, 
in our lungs, there is a defense. Macrophages and dendrites take these incoming spores and annihilate the threat entirely. When a fungal spore enters the lungs, it attaches itself to the surface and begins trying to stake a claim to its new home. However, your body ain't having that, playa. The macrophages move in and attack the surface, releasing oxygen reactive components. This will destroy the fungal spore completely and the macrophage will move on to the next one it finds. This is the innate immune system hard at work. However, knowing what we know, there are clearly some flaws. It can be overwhelmed and at which point the adaptive immune system should be activated, but what if the body can't react in time to this threat? This is how the cordyceps fungus operates in The Last of Us. There exists a certain type of cordyceps that is actively being used right now, just in case you guys want to know this, to aid in organ transplantation as it possesses the ability to suppress the human immune system. This allows the organs to exist within the body without the constant threat of being attacked by its own immune system. So since we know in real life that cordyceps has the ability to suppress the immune system, I would say this suppression allows the cordyceps to enter the lungs of a person via spore and deactivate or overwhelm the innate immune system. However, the adaptive immune system is never activated afterwards, so the cordyceps begins to overtake a human in one to two days. So let's discuss what happened in The Last of Us and how it all went wrong for those who may or may not have played the game or are not familiar with the story. In The Last of Us, this fungus evolved in South America as supported by the intro and multiple sources. Now we get to a set of events that would make the most sense in my mind and kind of add a little bit of extra information on how the outbreak actually happened. The area presumably had many humans in it and possibly certain types of native primates. One of the interesting things is that over time the fungus was probably able to jump from the simians to the humans rather than from the insect to the humans. It's almost like how HIV made the jump from simian immunodeficiency virus to human immunodeficiency virus. While primates in the area may not have been affected by the fungus, it decimated humans. Which, side tangent, I absolutely love this. It's totally supported by the game because in-game, primates were experimented on with the fungus and seemed to not suffer the ill effects of this fungus, instead coexisting with it quite easily, which means that they were carriers. Whereas if a human was bitten by a specific monkey, they would turn. And this was seen by by the scientist who actually tried to free the monkeys instead of terminating them after the experiment, he was bitten and he knew he would begin to turn. But it's always so strange because simians are able to exist with say SIV and not really be affected by it and they live long lives liken it to a cold. However, HIV completely destroys the immune system, leaving them open to opportunistic diseases. And I know I'm jumping back and forth, but it's, it's pretty interesting to see how this comparison is very similar. So it seems quite possible in my mind that these apes in the area were eating infected insects with cordyceps in their bodies, so their bodies were able to adapt to the disease over time, so it did not affect them in the way it did humans. So if I had to take a stab at it, I would say the fungus began its evolutionary path in the insects that eventually made its way into monkeys and finally made the jump to humanity via the crops that the monkeys frequented. From here, chaos broke out as human infection rates began to climb. The cordyceps would enter either by bite wound or from the spores in the air. Obviously the most dangerous areas were the cities and large towns at this point. In the early stages, pandemonium broke out all over as nobody could pinpoint exactly what was causing the aggression and infection seen in certain individuals. Many would fall to spores simply because of ignorance and lack of understanding as what was spreading the disease. Others would quite literally be eaten alive by other infected humans. The disease spread even further by a two-prong attack. The large population centers had people who were infected flee into the surrounding area, further infecting those areas, and anyone who chose to stay in the city would have to contend with the spores from the abandoned buildings, further turning the survivors. One thing that should be noted is the spores do not infect effectively in open air and have to be kind of contained within low flow areas. This suggests there needs to be a certain amount of fungal load to infect you. Breathing in one spore might not overload your immune system, but breathing in thousands might do the trick. Eventually the military was called in and martial law was declared. Unfortunately, human nature reared its ugly head and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The military ruled with an iron fist suppressing the people within the quarantine zone by withholding rations and executing many who tried to enter the city even if they were not infected. This led to a resistant movement called the Fireflies who began to fight back. The government at this time was barely functioning to any effective capacity as all branches had been shut down and only the ones with guns ruled. This fighting between the Fireflies and the military would further destabilize areas leading to more infections and less effective 
effective resistance against the disease. In the absolute state of human panic, many people died as society broke down and it became a game end or be game ended scenario. Bands of hunters began to crop up taking out people who tread on their turf with little to no conscience about it, which chased away the military who had actually brought about a semi-stable state. Eventually, everything that could go wrong did go wrong in The Last of Us. Rather than focusing on a cure for the disease, which should have been a world effort, humanity turned against itself in an effort to secure individual survival, all while the disease spread further and further, producing more and more threats. Eventually, 20 years had passed and humanity was on the back burner. A shell of its former glory, the ones who were left scrounged in the post-apocalyptic society that is rife with death and injustice. There are some safe havens, but even then, it's under authoritarian rule. These quarantine zones are few in number, and many of them have been overrun had the military abandoned it or the people rose up and fought only later to become the oppressors themselves through time. And this is where everything kicks off. After humanity had essentially lost the fight to the disease and to itself, it seems that one person in particular may have developed some form of resistance or immunity to the cordyceps fungus. Whether this version is just a genetic mutation of the cordyceps itself or the person is unknown, but it does give hope for humanity as a whole that maybe they will rise up once again. Overall, this cordyceps fungus decimated humanity, taking out 60% of the population or infecting them. Judging by the human population being roughly 7,162,119,434 at the time of 2013, this left around 2,864,847,733 people after the outbreak. And judging by all the attacks afterwards and infighting, the population is much lower than that during the events of The Last of Us. I just want to point out, however, in our actual world, this is quite improbable. The spores of the corset fungus are quite visible to the naked eye and would raise immediate suspicions about what this is. Quarantines would be activated, but soon after, the distribution of mass breathing apparatuses would become quite normal. It's fun to think about these ideas, but in reality, a disease like this would have an impact, but arguably not this sort of impact. The fungus more than likely would not react well to cold conditions due to its evolution in warm tropical climates. Humans in colder climates would likely not experience the infection rate seen in warmer climates, which means government organizations, scientists, World Health Organization, CDC personnel, military, etc. would fall back to these areas and begin working on a cure immediately. Well, that was quite biology heavy, but it explains what is happening in The Last of Us and how things got out of hand so quickly. So now that you are all caught up with the cordyceps fungus and what these zombies are infected with in The Last of Us, I will be diving into their biology and how exactly they are affected by this fungus in later episodes. There are four distinct stages of infection, so expect about four episodes out of it. Anyhow, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you are new, subbing is a great way to stay caught up with the channel. Well, it was, but now you have to hit that notification bell, which works about 1% of the time by my count, which is pretty cool. And if you are a regular, hitting the like helps get the video out there. I will drop my Twitter, Discord, and Patreon links in the description, and if you'd like to support the channel, those are great ways to do it. And speaking of patrons, I would like to thank mine. At the scientist tier, we have Arlon Lupe. Next up, our residents are A. Lorantis, Evan Osborne, Greater Genes 83, Oz Hickman, and Richard Muhlenberg. Our PhD in genetics are Allison Caspero, Andrew Lawson, Divine Whisper, Laffy No Skill, and Steve N. Holding it down with our Masters in Biology, we have Adam Hartswick, Brendan Brotherton, Cameron Smith, Edgy McGee, Scott Grant, The Ren of Lies, and The Otter Man. And with their Bachelors in Morphological Sciences, we have Ahi Gao Comics, Anthony Charles West, Anthony Wolf, Captain Gasmask, Dustin Ellis, Eric Scott Gillies, Jims, Professor Bennett, Riot, Russell McBride, Santos Lopez, and Zachary Baker. Thank you guys for your continued support. Also, I just want to throw it out there, I am playing Dead Space on Impossible Mode, and I've arguably only died about three times in earnest. The rest were me dying by literally my own hubris. So anyhow, thanks for watching Roanoke Gaming, and I will see y'all in the next one.